second. Fantastic. So thank you so much to the organizers of our Evo Fun Path uh, program for hosting this seminar. And it is an absolute pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Joe Heitman. So Joe is a James B. Duke professor and chair of the Department of Molecular Genetics and Microbiology at Duke University. He serves as the director of the Tri-Institutional Molecular Mycology and Pathogenesis Training Program, and he is an inspiring and incredible human being on every level. I have known Joe for about 23 years when I was a, a young graduate student, and I can say he most certainly influenced the trajectory of my career, and he has done so for so many others in the field. He is a true community builder and has really shaped the whole field of, of fungal pathogenesis. He has uh, trained over 53 fellows, 21 graduate students, and 46 undergraduates. So just amazing to see his, his trainees thrive uh, in leadership roles all around the world. He has published over 500 articles, so he kind of puts us all to shame, or at least inspires us all to greater heights. And he has been the recipient of so many awards. Uh, it, is, it is really hard to enumerate, but just to highlight a few, he's an elected member of the American Society for Clinical Investigation, a fellow of the Infectious Disease Society of America, received the Squib Award, a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology, the American Association for Advancement of Science. He received recently at the Edward Novitsky Prize, the Rhonda Benham Award in Medical Mycology. He is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the National Academy of Sciences, the German National Academy of Sciences. And I could go on and on, but I won't because we all wanna hear Joe's fantastic science. His research is uh, at the forefront of the field and covers you know, phenomenal breadth from the evolution of sex and fungi to understanding stress response, nutrient sensing, uh, and targets of small molecules and really exciting mechanisms of drug resistance. So I think we're gonna hear about some of that work today and based on the title, I think really cool uh, new mechanism of, of drug resistance, which I think inspires all kinds of new insights about genomic plasticity and genetic change and potential for evolution. So at that, I will turn it over to Joe uh, and look forward to hearing from him. Thanks very much, Leah. And um, it's a great pleasure to be here today. I want to begin by thanking Christian and Isabel and Leah for the invitation to join with you. And I've been hearing just a bit about your training program and how you are um, far flung across all of Canada, which is why we're meeting here via Zoom rather than in person. And it's really a great pleasure and opportunity to be here. And what I want to tell you about today is a story about antimicrobial drug resistance. And it's a project that began as a, a, a summer project for a rotation student in the lab. And Leah mentioned um, all the trainees that have been in my lab. And I, I think really at some level, one might think that PIs make all the discoveries that happen, but in reality, we know it's the people at the bench that make the discoveries and we help to um, shepherd those into print. So I've been really fortunate and grateful to the undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, and um, long-term staff that have worked in my group. Let me see if I can turn on my laser pointer here. And I wanna begin to put this story into a historic context. And this starts with Max Delbruck, who many of you may know was an icon of the early days of molecular biology. He was part of the phage school of molecular biology. He was originally a physicist and then became fascinated by the molecular nature of life and chose a very simple system to interrogate questions about how genetics and information flow happens in living systems. And together with uh, um, Salvador Luria, they focused on um, bacteriophages or viruses and uh, the bacteria E. coli. And this is one of their more famous studies um, that gets to the root of how mutations occur in populations. And some people refer to this as the Luria Delbruck fluctuation test or fluctuation experiment. And you can see it was published quite a long time ago in genetics. So this is really just to set the stage. This is a textbook um, exposition of their experiment. And what they did was they took cultures of E. coli, the bacteria E. coli, 
And if they grew a single subculture and then um, tested it multiple times, multiple aliquots, to look at how many might be resistant to a lytic phage called T1, you can see there's a little bit of variation here, but that's really just the experimental variation around the, the mean or the average. But there's a second arm to their experiment in which they grew multiple independent subcultures and individually tested those. And you can see that in some of these, there were no resistant bacteria or maybe one or two, but in some, there were very many bacteriophage resistant colonies. And this is referred to as the jackpot effect. Now, from just this simple experimental paradigm and then some sophisticated statistics, they were able to discern and intuit that the mutations were occurring spontaneously in the population. And depending on when the mutation occurs, whether it arrives early in a culture or arrives late in a culture or never arrives, determines how many resistant bacteria might be in that individual subculture. And this is the basis then for thinking that mutations occur spontaneously in populations and then selections act upon that variation that's occurring. Oh, my screen seems to be frozen. Let me see if I can get out for a sec. There we go. Okay, so uh, based on these studies and others, uh, Max Delbrook and Salvador Luria shared the Nobel Prize with Al Hershey in 1969, and the citation reads for their discoveries concerning the replication mechanism and the genetic structure of viruses. Now, what you might not know about Max Delbruck is that after he received the Nobel Prize, he completely shifted his research focus to the organism shown on the next slide. And this is uh, Phycomyces blakeslianus. Um, this is a fungus, and it um, grows strictly as a hyphal organism. These are dramatic sporangiophores shown here. Um, and what Max was fascinated by was the ability of this organism to sense um, extracellular cues. And these are as diverse as light, touch, wind, gravity, and even adjacent objects. If you put Phycomyces up against a surface, you can sense it in some way and grow away from it. Now, in this case here, what you're seeing is the wild type on the right, and it's sensing a blue light source from the edge of the uh, slide here. And this is a mutant uh, that's blind to light that was isolated in Delbrook's lab many, many years ago. Now, Phycomyces is a fantastic organism for studies of basic nature like this, but it's not a pathogen. It has no yeast phase. It's not a human pathogen. And so we spent some years working on phycomyces in the lab. Uh, this was work of Alex Idnerm, who identified light sensors and the mating type locus and um, contributed to the genome project. But when he departed the lab and a new postdoc arrived, Su Chan Li, we shifted our focus to the organism I'm gonna focus on today called Mucor sersenoloides. This is a picture of Su Chan Li here. He's now on the faculty at University of Texas in San Antonio. And his rationale for choosing this organism was that it was a human pathogen. You could transform it and um, uh, delete genes by homologous recombination. The organism is dimorphic, so it can grow as both a yeast and as a hyphal organism. And the genome was being sequenced and um, that's uh, codified in two papers down here at the bottom in current biology and a, and a related one that was in PLOS genetics. Now, what we know about Phycomyces and its relative mucor is that they lie in the basal tree of the fungal tree of life. So this image here depicts uh, the fungal tree of life. We know a lot about these two phyla here, the Ascomycota and the Basidiomycota. They have a monophyletic origin stemming from this green era, which means they share a more recent common ancestor than all of these other basal phyla in the fungal kingdom. Now we know a lot about ascomycetes like Neurospora, Aspergillus, Saccharomyces, Candida. 
we know quite a bit about several basidiomyces, like the pathogen of maize, Ustolago, or the human pathogen, Cryptococcus. But we know quite a bit less about the fungi that populate these basal um, phyla of the fungal tree of life. One group that you may have heard about are the chytrids, because these are aquatic fungi. They're modal, they have flagella, and there are two particular species that have been causing infections throughout animals globally. One that's been causing extinctions in frogs, and the other that's threatening salamanders globally. These are the Batrachochytrium species. They lie within this phylum here, um, depicted in yellow. Now we're gonna focus on mucor, and, which lies in the mucor railies, indicated by the red arrow. And Phycomyces blakeslianus and Rhizopus arise and Rhizopus delamar, they all lie within this group as well. Now, what do we know about these organisms? Well, um, many of these are devastating human fungal pathogens and they cause truly um, life-threatening infections. We have very few drugs to treat them, limited to amphotericin B or liposomal formulations, posiconazole, isobuconazole. In some cases, surgery is required to debreed these infections and accelerate recovery. And there's a variety of diverse understudied organisms um, in the mucorrhizes that cause human infection. You may have been uh, reading in the news about infections occurring in COVID patients, for example, uh, particularly in India, and many of those infections are caused by mucorrhizes fungi. Now, our story about mucor begins with its growth mode. So in the petri dish in the middle here, this is the standard hyphal mat or lawn that mucor forms when it grows on a standard YPD plate. And what we discovered is if we expose the organism to a natural product that has both antifungal and immunosuppressive activity called FK506, it completely shifted the growth mode of the organism. And you see this little compact colony here. If you look in the microscope, what you see in the plate from the, um, the left here, where it's hypo, you see all of these branching hyphae. But in contrast, from this spot on the FK506 plate, you see a multi-budded yeast. Now, what's remarkable about that is that this dimorphic property had been discovered more than a century, almost a century and a half ago, by Louis Pasteur himself in this classic paper published in 1876. And what they found is if they grow the organism anaerobically, so without oxygen and with a little bit of CO2, that would stimulate the transition to the multibudded yeast. And Solomon Bartnicki Garcia rediscovered this in 1962, particularly the role of carbon dioxide in promoting this dimorphic transition. Now, in the case of um, exposure to FK506, this is occurring under aerobic conditions, so in the complete presence of oxygen. So it's somehow bypassing the need for anaerobic growth and CO2 and stimulating the dimorphic transition. So we've capitalized on this observation to isolate variants that are resistant to FK506. Now, I wanna tell you about the mechanism of action of this natural product antifungal compound because that'll help place this in context. So in the middle of the slide, this is a cartoon showing FK506. It's a macrolide natural product made by Streptomyces bacteria in the soil. It diffuses into the cell, and it first binds to a binding protein called FKBP12, and it forms a protein small molecule complex. This turns out to be the active agent or the active drug in the cell, and it binds to with high affinity and inhibits uh, this complex of proteins, which is a phosphatase called calcineurin. This is a calcium comodulin activated serine threonine specific phosphatase. Now on the right hand of the slide is the crystal structure and showing the ternary complex between calcineurin, FK506 and FKBP12. So the drug receptor FKBP is in gold, FK506 is in blue, and then the two subunits, the phosphatase, the active catalytic subunit is in green, and then the regulatory subunit, 
is in cyan, and these red molecules depict the active site of the phosphatase. What's important here is that where the inhibitor binds um, is not the active site. So this is not a competitive inhibitor. It blocks substrates access by occlusion. So it's a non-competitive inhibitor. And it's targeting a region of the phosphatase that's completely unique to calcineurin. It's not shared with any other phosphatase in the cell. All of that homology is in this catalytic region here. So it makes this inhibitor exquisitely specific for just this phosphatase. Now, it turns out this is the mechanism of action for antifungal activity. All of these proteins are present in fungi. It also turns out this is the mechanism of action for the immunosuppressive activity of FK506 in our immune system. In our T cells um, that are involved in rejecting organs that are transplanted into the body, calcineurin plays a very specific role in responding to calcium fluxes in response to antigens presented to the T cell. And it's responsible for dephosphorylating the nuclear factor of activated T cells, NFAT. So the mechanism by which this inhibits fungal growth and concomitantly inhibits the immune system is through the same molecular targets. Now, on the other half of the slide is an illustration of a completely distinct natural product called cyclosporin. It's a cyclic peptide. It's made by a fungus that lives in the soil. But like FK506, it goes into the cell. It binds to a receptor called cyclophilin A. And even though these complexes look nothing like each other, it also binds to and inhibits calcineurin. And this is the high resolution ternary structure of that complex. So both cyclosporin and FK506 have gone on to be um, gold standard drugs for organ transplant recipients. Now, if we return to our story about mucor, I'll remind you this is the growth on control media. If we add FK506, it completely switches the growth mode to this compact yeast colony. And if we just keep incubating this Petri dish, lo and behold, you find these drug-resistant sectors arising. You find a very large one here that arose early during the culture. And you find smaller ones that arose later in the growth of this culture, analogous to sort of the jackpot effect or the late arriving mutations from the Luria Delbruck fluctuation test. And if you look at these under the microscope, you see on this side there are hyphae, here are multibudded yeasts, and here these sectors are restored to hyphal growth. So, how did the organism become drug resistant? And it turns out there are two mechanisms of resistance. The first mechanism involves mutations in the targets that we just talked about. Calcineurin A or calcineurin B, the catalytic or the regulatory subunit, or in FKBP12. And these Petri dishes show you this is an FKBP12 mutant. These are two different calcineurin B mutations. These are two different calcineurin A mutations. We can model these on the known crystal structure. And um, the mutations that lead to a loss of FKBP12 confer drug resistance. But correspondingly, mutations that change amino acids on the um, inhibitor target on calcineurin A or calcineurin B, they cause dominant drug resistance because they block binding of the inhibitor complex to the phosphatase. And you can model the impact of those mutations based on the crystal structures. So this is a nice validation that the drug is acting through the targets that we've already known about in T cells, in Saccharomyces, in Canada, in Cryptococcus. But that's not where our story ends today. There's a second class of drug-resistant isolates. And it turns out that these isolates have no mutation anywhere in their genome, no mutation in FKBP12 or calcineurin A or calcineurin B. And one such isolate is shown here. This is the wild type on the left. And this is Cecilia Schertz isolate 2-1 that that um, rotating graduate student isolated in the summer project. And lo and behold, that isolate's resistant to FK506 compared to the wild type. And it's cross-resistant to a second drug that we haven't introduced yet called 
rapamycin. So like FK506, rapamycin is a natural product. It's made by a different streptomyces species that lives in the soil. And yet it shares half of its macrolide ring with FK506. And both of these drugs bind to FKBP12. But instead of inhibiting calcineurin, rapamycin binds to a different target in the cell that's called TOR. And that's an acronym for target of rapamycin. So the one commonality to the mechanism of action of these two antifungal drugs is they have to bind to FKBP12 to inhibit growth. And because these isolates are cross-resistant to both of these, it implicates some defect in FKBP12. Now, when we first saw this, we, of course, we did PCR and we sequenced the open reading frame of the gene and we found no mutation. So we thought, oh, it must be in the promoter region. And we designed other primers and sequenced the promoter region. No mutation. Aha, it must be in the three prime untranslated region. So we PCR amplified that and sequenced it. There was no mutations there. And ultimately through whole genome sequencing, we found there's no gene, there's no mutation anywhere. So why are they drug resistant became the question. And about 30% of Cecilius isolates had this unusual property. Now, I can tell you a bit more about these isolates. We had an antibody raised against FKBP12 from Saccharomyces cerevisiae. It cross-reacts with the protein from mucor. If we delete the gene, uh, the protein disappears. And in these uh, resistant isolates of Cecilius, the protein is missing. And by northern blot, the mRNA encoding FKBP12 was also missing. So it looks like a mutant but there's no mutation. So what explains the loss of the protein in the RNA? Well, at this stage, Cecilia came into my office and she said, you know, I'm really, really frustrated with these isolates because when I passage them on YPD, they start losing their phenotype. They aren't drug resistant anymore. And this is really frustrating. And, and we talked about this for a while and then we realized, well, maybe this is interesting because it's a kind of, transient antimicrobial drug resistance, and maybe that'll be a clue. So we made a very organized experiment. We took two different wild types. When we passage them, they always grow as a yeast on FK506 media, indicated by a Y. So they, re they remain sensitive no matter how long we passage them. If we took an isolate where we deleted the FKBP12 gene or a mutant that had a um, amino acid substitution, they always grow as a hyphae. They're always resistant to FK506. But these were three of Cecilia's isolates that were unstable. And as we passage them, you can see each one of them reverted to becoming drug sensitive again. Instead of growing as the resistant hyphae, they're the sensitive yeast form. And it was at a different passage, depending on which isolate. So there was some chance uh, involved here as well. And when these three isolates reverted to being sensitive, they became as sensitive as the wild type to FK506 and as sensitive as the wild type to rapamycin. So when you select for them, they become drug resistant, the protein in the RNA goes away. But if you passage them for a while without the drug, they lose their drug resistance property. Now, when they become sensitive again, lo and behold, the protein is expressed by Western blot and by northern blot, the mRNA encoding the protein is expressed again. So in some transient way, the gene has gone off and then it's magically come back on. Now we considered a number of possible models for this, but I wanna tell you about the one that turned out to be the productive model. And that was to consider that there were groups in Spain that had been working on the RNAi pathways in mucor and they had identified canonical subunits or proteins, including a dicer, argonauts, and RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, and published a series of papers on this. And so we entertained the idea that, well, maybe in these transient drug-resistant isolates, maybe somehow RNAi had turned on and silenced the FKBP12 gene. And to test that, we prepared small RNAs from a variety of strains. We ran them out on polyacrylamide gels, transferred them to filters, 
and then probe these with a probe that's specific for antisense to the FKBP12 gene. Now you can see in the wild type, there's no small RNA hybridizing to the gene, but in each of these different epimutant isolates, when they are grown in the presence of FK506, or they're still in their resistant form, they have abundant small RNAs. And when they revert to being sensitive, all of those small RNAs disappeared in every case. We went on to make whole genome libraries of small RNAs and sequence these to look at the whole genome repertoire. And what I'm showing you here is an alignment of the small RNAs to the FKBP12 gene in the genome. It has three exons and two introns. You can see in the wild type, there's no small RNAs similar to the blot, but in the three different epimutants, you see um, small RNAs corresponding to both the antisense and the sense strands, but only to the exons of the gene, no small RNAs corresponding to the introns. And it suggests that it might be the mature RNA that's the target of the siRNA rather than the genomic locus. Now, when those strains revert to being sensitive, essentially all those small RNAs disappear. Now, the other important finding was that there was no increase in small RNAs anywhere else in the genome, not to the gene. Oops, uh, let's go back, sorry not to the gene on the five prime side, not to the gene on the three prime side, not to any other genes in the genome. So to a first approximation, only this gene has been silenced by small RNA in the genome in these drug resistant isolates. Now there are lots of other loci that have small RNAs. Many of them are transposons, for example, but those don't change when they're resistant or sensitive to FK506 or rapamycin, just this gene. Now, um, at about this point in the story, um, Sylvia Kahlo joined the lab. She had done her graduate work um, at the lab at the University of Murcia, where the RNAi components were identified. And um, she had made mutations in many, if not all, of the RNAi pathways in the organism. So she brought all of her mutants with her to the lab. She repeated the screen for. FK506 resistant isolates. And then she simply took, these are wild type strains. These are Dicer mutants, Dicer 1 or Dicer 2 or RNA dependent RNA polymerase 2. And she just ran out small RNAs and probed for small RNAs to the FKBP12 locus. And then she could determine the frequency of epimutation in these different backgrounds. And then when she quantified this, as shown in this table, in the wild type, you find about 30% epimutants. But for example, in the RDRP2 mutant, you never found any epimutants. Now, this leads to um, sort of a lower bound on what the frequency is, but it's below the detection limit. And so by this process, we could identify a whole series of RNAi components, Dicer, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase 2, Argonaut 1, an exonuclease, and a helicase that were absolutely required for the formation of these epimutations. Now, by the same approach, she could show that some of the RNAi components, and there's two other Argonauts called Argonaut 2 and Argonaut 3, they were dispensable for epimutants, and epimutants form at about the same frequency as in wild type. So some RNA components are required and some are not, and probably function in a different pathway. Now she found a third category of mutant that it originally surprised us because we weren't anticipating it. And that category in these mutants, RNAi mutants, she found many more epimutants. So for example, here's the RDRP1. Almost all of the drug resistant isolates are epimutants. The frequency is about 80%. And these epimutants were much more stable than in the wild type background. So no matter how long we passaged them, we never saw them reverting. So these observations allowed us to put these components into a series of RNAi pathways that are operating in mucor. We've been talking about this epimutation pathway by which um, antifungal drug resistance emerges. 
And there are several other components though, when we mutate them, it increases the activity of this pathway. And so the model is that the aberrant RNA that channels into the RNAi pathway uh, can either enter the epimutational pathway or can enter this non-canonical degradation pathway. And in this pathway, um, uh, dicer is replaced by an alternative dicer called R3B2. You'll see that there's the two RNA dependent RNA polymerases, RDRP1 and RDRP3. These three are the mutants that give rise to a higher frequency of epimutation and very stable epimutants. And so we think these two pathways are competing for the aberrant RNA, one to degrade it, one to channel it into an epimutational pathway. Now, this has been revealed by using mutants that inactivate this pathway, but you can imagine that there might be regulatory conditions in which the activity of this competing pathway is either increased or decreased. And by that approach, the cell might modulate the level or the frequency or the stability of epimutants that arise in response to different selective pressures. So for example, stress might promote this pathway by dampening the activity of this pathway. Now, you may be wondering, well, how did this ever start in the first place? How did you get RNAi or small RNAs to the FKBP12 gene? And usually there's a double strand RNA intermediate. And when we looked at the organization of the genes in the genome, it turned out the FKBP12 gene is overlapping the neighboring gene, right, which is a, a putative polyamine transporter. And there's about 92 base pairs of overlap between the two transcripts. So we thought, aha, this must be double-stranded RNA. Maybe the poly -A tails are cleaved. Maybe RNA-dependent RNA polymerases extend this and you dice it to silence the gene. So to address this, we deleted the PAT-A gene and found it had absolutely no impact on epimutation. These are a whole variety of epimutants arising in a PAT-A deletion background. And in, in retrospect, we didn't find ever any small RNAs that correspond to this part of the PAT-A message, only to FKBP12. So that might've been a clue that this might not be a double-stranded region in the cell. Now, subsequently, we discovered that there's a naturally occurring antisense message um, corresponding to the sense FKBP12 message. And by uh, making cDNAs and sequencing it, this corresponds to the mature antisense. So there are no introns in it. And like the sense strand, it disappears when these isolates are drug resistant, and then it comes back when they're sensitive again. So we think that in some circumstances, the sense and the antisense find each other as a double strand intermediate for RNAi. Now this suggests there might be an RNA dependent RNA polymerase that generates this antisense. We've checked in each of the single RNA R RDRP mutants and they all still make this antisense. So either there may be some redundancy here or there may be another RNA dependent RNA polymerase um, that we haven't identified. So to summarize, um, we found um, spontaneous FK506 resistant mutants can result from either stable mutations or unstable epimutants. There's no change in the FKBP12 gene at the nucleotide level, but both the mRNA and the protein are absent and you find abundant small RNAs. And this pathway, um, RNAi pathway may be regulated or stochastic and appears that it might involve an antisense RNA as the trigger. Now, at this point, we sent this study to Nature and it was reviewed and the reviewers and the editor said that it was pretty interesting, but this was um, all based on studies of one gene in one organism. And they said, can you just show us that this occurs for another gene or, or show, it, uh, show us that it occurs in another species? So we spent about six months trying to do both of those things unsuccessfully. And we were just about to write back to nature and say, you know, when introns were discovered, it was in one gene and one virus, and that, that worked out pretty well. It turned out to be generalizable. Maybe this will be as well. But we had one last lab meeting, and we realized 
we were working on very closely related isolates of mucor that people had called forma or varieties. But as the genomes were being sequenced, it became clear that they were different species. And everything I've told you about is in a species that we now know as mucor lusitanicus. So we decided to very quickly test an isolates from a different species called mucor circinoloides. Some of the epimutants are shown on this slide here that are drug resistant. You'll see that there are lots of abundant small RNAs in these isolates. The frequency of epimutants in this species was about 80%, so even higher than in the original species. So we revised our paper, sent it back to nature, and they said, aha, this is nicely generalizable. And they accepted it and published it. And even I was surprised because these are very, very closely related species. So I thought that they might not find that satisfactory. Uh, so a good lesson in navigating the politics of publications. Now, um, one of the other things that we had tried unsuccessfully was to isolate epimutants in two other genes. And these are genes in the pyrimidine nucleotide biosynthetic pathway. We call them pure F and pure G. In other fungi, they're often called Ura3 and Ura5. And you can select for loss of function in these genes and the corresponding enzymes with a toxin called 5-fluoroerotic acid, 5-FOA. So Sylvia had tried this unsuccessfully. A new MD-PhD student, Zanetta Chang, joined the lab, and she succeeded. But she succeeded by using a genetic helping hand. So instead of doing this with a wild type, she used some of those mutant backgrounds where there's a higher frequency of epi mutations and they're more stable. So for example, RDRP1 or R3B2. And lo and behold, she found epi mutants in both genes. So here's the small RNA block for two of her pure F epi mutants. And here's a block for her pure G epi mutant. And um, these isolates are um, resistant to 5-fluoroerotic acid, the toxin I mentioned. Uh, but if we passage them, so for example, this isolate's been passaged 10 times, it loses its drug resistance. And similarly, this mutant, if we passage it, it loses its drug resistance. Now, this is unusual because the epimutants in these backgrounds uh, for the FKBP12 gene are very stable. They never revert. So there seems to be a difference for the pure F and the pure G loci. It's harder to get an epimutant to begin with. And even when we can find it in a background that we would think would normally stabilize it, they're revertible. So not every uh, gene in the genome is equally poised to form epimutants. Um, Zanetta went on to make small RNA libraries and sequence the whole genome. And this shows the distribution of the small RNAs for the pure F gene. It's just a single large exon. This is for uh, the pure G gene, which has three exons. And again, the small RNAs are only decorating the exons and they're not um, hybridizing to genes upstream or downstream of these loci. There might be a little bit of spreading of this message here probably because that's where this mRNA starts. And there's no amplification elsewhere in the genome. And red is in the resistant isolate, and blue is when they've reverted. So again, most, if not all, of the small RNAs go away when these isolates revert. Now, uh, many people have asked us if um, there's changes in heterochromatin that occur during the formation of these epimutations. And we didn't think that would be the case because the small RNAs are targeting the exons and not the introns. We thought if the whole locus was shut down by heterochromatin, maybe you would have small RNAs to the entire genetic locus. But we did chromatin immunoprecipitation analysis for a specific histone mark, H3K9 dimethyl, that's specific for heterochromatin. We can use transposable elements that are um, decorated with these heterochromatic marks. And then if we look at our wild type or the epimutant loci, uh, looking at the five prime region and exon and intron, the three prime region in two different um, species, we find no increase in heterochromatic marks um, either by uh, chip seek or by um, 
whole genome chip seq. Uh, this is RT PCR analysis, and then this is chip seq. Now, we also can probe for the occupancy by RNA polymerase 2 and show that it's present on both the wild type and on the epimutant gene. So this implicates post-transcriptional genetic silencing mechanisms rather than heterochromatin-based mechanisms, which would shut down all uh, transcription. Um, this is the corresponding analysis of one of those transposons I mentioned that's decorated with both H3K9 dimethyl and trimethyl, and there's no uh, significant signal from RNA polymerase. And we have done the same thing with the pure F and the pure G epimutants. So there's congruent findings in three distinct epimutant loci in two different species that completely exclude heterochromatin from being involved in the mechanism here. Now, Grit Walter and her colleagues at the um, University of Jena in Germany have been um, conducting a detailed phylogenetic analysis of the mucor species complex. And I've been telling you about mucor lusitanicus and mucor circinoloides. And what Grit and Sibir Nahug and others have found is there's 16 phylogenetic species across this complex. And seven of those are known to be human pathogens. It's the ones where there are more isolates than some of the others because these occur from clinical cases. Um, so we've set up a collaboration with Grit. She sent us isolates for each of these phylogenetic species, and we're busy looking to see if epimutations occur across the whole species complex. Now, the other thing they did was to discover the holy grail for mucor genetics. And we've known about a sexual cycle for mucor for many years, but nobody could ever get the spores to germinate. And lo and behold, Grit and her students found two isolates um, from mucor succinoloides, where when they dissect the spores, now you can see the spore uh, germinating beautifully. So this allows you to now complete the sexual cycle. And uh, we wanted to be able to do this so we could look and see if these epimutants are stable through a genetic cross. They're stable during mitosis, but would they be stable during meiosis and be inheritable? So this is the kind of experiment we set up where we're doing genetic crosses between a wild type and a wild type or a wild type and an epimutant. We take the spores and then plate them on either control media or media with FK506 or media with FK506 and rapamycin. We're using strains that are genetically distinct from each other. So we have different markers we can score by PCR and RFLP to confirm that meiosis has occurred. And from a set of progeny that we've identified, you can see that at least three out of 10 progeny are drug resistant on either the FK506 media or the FK506 rapamycin media. By analysis of markers, it's clear that they are recombinant, so they're meiotic progeny. Um, and when we isolate small RNAs from both the resistant wild type and a reverted form of it, we can show that for at least two of these F1 progeny, they're epimutants that have abundant small RNAs, and when they've reverted, those small RNAs disappear. So this provides evidence that um, an epimutant is stable enough to be inherited through a genetic cross. Now, it's quite interesting that not all the progeny inherit it. You might have thought that this would behave um, dominantly in a way because the small RNAs could spread. So in essence, I think it's interesting that it's inheritable and also that it's not inherited by all the progeny. And that might be a bet hedging strategy that the organism is uh, deploying. Um, so um, a couple of final experiments that Zanetta did before she graduated and went on to her clinical training. And these involve animal studies. And the first question she asked was if she infects mice with an epimutant drug resistant strain, and then recovers colony forming units from the animals, will the epimutant be stable during the infection? And what she did is she isolated colony forming units from a variety of different tissues. And you can see that when they are derived from the liver, the spleen, the kidney, and the lung, they're almost 100% resistant. So the epimutant is incredibly stable in those tissues. And this suggests that if an epimutant arose in the context of an infection, either a mouse or a human, it could be stable enough to impart antifungal drug resistance. 
The one other interesting finding was that in the isolates from the brain, about half of them had reverted to drug sensitivity. So again, there's some plasticity. We don't know why they're reverting in the brain. It could be that they've just undergone more replicative cycles there, or it could be some other difference in the nature of the central nervous system. Now, the other experiment that Zanetta did was she infected with a drug-sensitive isolate and then recovered colony-forming units on FK506 media. And the reason she was doing this is because it's very hard to enumerate colony-forming units for a hyphal organism. But if you can grow an organism on FK506 and it grows as a yeast, it's easy to count colony-forming units. But what she found was that there was a higher level of intrinsic FK506 resistance occurring when the CFU was derived from the brain compared to other organs. So about five to 10% of the isolates from the brain were already drug resistant. These are showing that these are epimutant um, drug resistant isolates. She found only one example of a Mendelian mutant, a transposon had jumped into the FKBP12 gene. All the other ones were epimutes. So there's something very unique about the brain in the mouse um, that there's some level of instability of epimutants there, and there's also some induction of epimutants happening there. And we think that could be in response to stress in the CNS. This is the final experiment Zanetta did before she graduated. She infected mice, she recovered CFU from the brain and the liver and grew these ex vivo for four, six or eight days. This is a control. And then she made small RNAs and made small RNA libraries and sequenced the whole genomic repertoire. Just to ask, might there be epimutants that are induced during infection of the mouse? And she didn't really find anything striking from the samples from the liver or the controls. But for these seven genes, she found abundant small RNAs being induced in all the isolates that came from the brain of the infected mice. So these are now called brain epimutant genes A through G. <clears throat> and with one exception, they're novel proteins. They have some domains that might hint at function. But BEPA turns out to be the ortholog of the cell wall integrity map kinase, MPKA. So we're interested in these. Um, Carlos um, and Maribel have joined the lab as postdocs. Uh, they also did this bioinformatic analysis. They also compared this small RNA distributions with what they had found um, to be mRNAs based on um, RNA-seq analysis, putting the related species, Mucor lusitanicus, into macrophages. And they noted that this was one of the genes that seemed to be reduced in mRNA abundance in the context of macrophages. And so it might be attributable to small RNA impacting uh, the level of the mRNA here. And we're in the midst of a whole series of experiments repeating this. Um, to see if um, these are seven different epimutants that we've combined, or if in all isolates, all <coughs> seven genes are being repressed simultaneously. We're also making um, gene deletions of each of these seven genes. Um, and we have a series of other experiments that are planned as part of an NIH R01 that recently received a fundable score. Um, this is um, AIM-2, and basically the goal is to take either the wild-type strain or the epimutants and to study them. <coughs> Sorry, I'm starting to lose my voice. I um, tested positive for COVID on Tuesday this week, and I've been holding up pretty well until just about this point. Um, so we're going to put these into macrophage cell cultures, into two different models for the blood-brain barrier to see if um, this instability might have to do with crossing the blood-brain barrier. We're um, growing them in um, brain organoids that are being produced in Debbie Silver's lab in our department. And we also wanna look in the whole animal model and 
do some micro dissections of different brain regions to see if we might be able to pinpoint a region of the brain where epimutants are either unstable or induced. So I wanna sum up and then generalize for you that we found these epimutations to be general and in, occurring in at least two different related species. We've found epimutations now in 10 different genes, three involving drug resistance and seven during infection. In vitro, at least, these epimutations seem to be spontaneous and stochastic. We haven't found stress conditions that induce them. And yet in the animal model, I've told you, we can find epimutants being induced there. And we think that must be in response to some type of stress during infection. These epimutants can be strictly epigenetic. And what I mean by that is if we take the epimutants that have reverted and we just repeat the selection again, we get epimutations at the same frequency. So it doesn't seem like a mutation occurred first that makes them more stable. Now, but I also told you that for pure F and pure G, we needed to have a genetic mutation before the epigenetic step. So you could imagine scenarios in which there are both genetic and epigenetic contributions that contribute. And so for example, some of the variability in the genetic cross might be due to underlying genetic differences in the parents. And then <coughs> epimutations are like my mutations inheritable. So they can survive going through sexual reproduction, including my meiosis and zygospore termination. So what's fascinating to me about this is from one plate, you get two different routes to phenotypic adaptation. <clears throat> one stable due to Mendelian mutation and the other transient and unstable due to epi mutation. And they're occurring side by side simultaneously. Now, epi mutations were not discovered first in fungi. It turns out they were discovered first in plants. And the person who discovered the very first epimutant is Carl Linnaeus. Um, he's a famous botanist, the father of taxonomy and phylogeny. And this is a mutant variant he isolated of snapdragon several centuries ago. Here's the wild type. It has bilateral symmetry. And this is the pyloric variant that he found that has radial symmetry. And so people interested in flower patterning genetics have been keeping this stock for centuries. And about 20 years ago, they discovered the gene and found that it wasn't mutated. Instead, it's undergone extensive DNA methylation. And that's the cause of its epimutant properties. And it's been inherited through flower crosses for centuries, but it's due uh, botanists had noted it reverts at some low frequency. Now, epimutations also occur in humans, and this is the case of a specific inheritable cancer syndrome. It's called Lynch syndrome or hereditary non polyposis colorectal cancer, HNPCC. These individuals typically have mutations in the mismatch repair system either in MSH2 or MLH1. And these papers describe three families where they have the classic um, cancer inheritable syndrome, but no mutation in the gene. And again, it's due to extensive DNA methylation. Recently, Peter Sarkis reported in C. elegans, a type of epimutation occurring during experimental evolution studies. They were growing different lines for 25 or 100 generations. And then they made small RNA libraries and sequenced them. And lo and behold, they found small RNA epimutants arising and disappearing at different times in these cultures. There was no selective pressure here. So these are just epimutations arising and disappearing, arising and disappearing. And they're repeating this now with different types of selective pressures with drugs that are toxic to nematodes. And then a final example is work from Robin Allshire at the University of Edinburgh. They were studying the model fission yeast, Schizosaccharomyces pombe, and they selected for caffeine resistant isolates. They found that some of these are stably resistant and some of them are unstably resistant. 
And Robin is an expert on heterochromatin. So he very quickly discovered that the enzyme that makes H3K9 dimethyl heterochromatin is required for the unstable drug resistance, but not for the stable drug resistance. So armed with that information, they did chromatin immunoprecipitation to look at where are the heterochromatic marks. In the wild type, on the three chromosomes, you only find heterochromatin at the telomeres and the centromeres of each chromosome. So there's nine total peaks. But in all of their unstable resistant, caffeine resistant isolates, they found a new peak of heterochromatin somewhere in the genome. And under that peak is a set of five or six genes that have been silenced. And in several cases, those genes are known to be involved in mediating caffeine resistance when they're mutant. So his model at the bottom is very similar to our model that you get two different kinds of isolates from the selective pressure, a resistant mutant and a resistant epimutant. And when you remove the selective pressure, one of those goes back to being wild type, the epimutant, whereas the mutant is permanently locked into its mutant phenotype. So this study suggests that there may be heterochromatin-based epimutants and many other fungi that have heterochromatin. So I wanna sum up that we've been talking about epimutations and these can occur via RNAi or via DNA methylation or via heterochromatin or even some combination of these. And it suggests that there are many other examples of this to be discovered in other eukaryotic microbes. Now, beyond epimutations, there are a variety of other processes that we know about that generate phenotypic diversity. We know from classic work in Sue Lindquist's lab about HSP90 buffering genetic variation and serving as a capacitor for evolution that's unleashed in response to stress, and it's inheritable. We know about prions. We know about aneuploidy. We know about mutators and hypermutators and sexual and parasexual reproduction. So the amount of time we devoted today to talking about epimutations, we could have spent just as much time talking about each of these other topics. And some of these have been covered in these two PLOS pearls here, if you're interested in uh, some of these other topics. And there are undoubtedly other um, modes of unstable transient um, variation that we don't know about yet. So I want to close and thank the people who did these studies. And this work all started when Cecilia was a graduate student in the lab, and then Sylvia uh, joined as a postdoc to bring the project to fruition. And from start to finish, I think the first paper on the subject was about seven years of combined effort. Su Chan started all the work on mucor in the lab, and then Zanetta did um, the work on pure F and pure G and those animal studies that I mentioned. This has been a long-term collaboration with colleagues in Spain, Rosa, Santiago, Puro, and Victor. And Carlos and Maribel were graduate students in Victor's lab when we started collaborating. They're now postdocs in the lab. So I've really benefited from three exceptionally well-trained geneticists coming from Spain to the lab as postdocs, and I'm very grateful uh, to their mentors. And I wanna close by thanking all the members of my group. Uh, our long-term NIH support. And I would also like to highlight um, that there, we're also supported by a CIFAR program called Fungal Kingdom Threats and Opportunities for which Leah and I have the privilege of serving as the co-directors. I'll stop there and be happy to answer any questions. Fantastic. So thank you very much, Joe. Extraordinary breadth uh, of seminar and amazing resilience <laughs> as well. <laughs> that 